So hello everyone, welcome to a deep dive into Apache Kafka. Thank you so much for coming. I know there's a lot of exciting talks on at this time, so we're very grateful that you've come to this one. My name's Kate Stanley. I'm Andrew Dunnings. And yeah, today we're going to be doing a deep dive into Apache Kafka. So first, just to get an idea of the audience, um, who here has already had a go at running a basic Kafka and doing producer consumer? Okay, a reasonable number. Um, who has done something beyond that? So actually starting to write some Java code to consume, produce, doing something more complicated with streams or something? And who's actually running in production with Kafka? Ooh, okay. Quite a few. Cool. So this is what we're planning to cover today. Uh, so this is broken into two parts and we'll have a break in the middle. So I'm going to be talking about event-driven applications, what is Kafka, and then going into the Kafka cluster and some of the details there. And then I'll be talking to you about producers, consumers, considerations for Apache Kafka in production. Then we'll take a half an hour break. And then after the break, I'll talk to you about Kafka Connect and change data capture. And then I'll finish off talking about Kafka Streams. Cool. All right. You can go sit down. Okay, so to get started, what is Kafka? Why are people going to event driven? So, more and more, I'm seeing people move from um, all of these new microservices or even existing systems that weren't microservices based and wanting to have events at the center of their applications. And by being event-based and event-driven, it really allows you to get better insight into the data that's flowing around your system because an event represents a lot more than a static piece of data because it tells you about what happened before and then what is happening now. So I'm just going to do a component of an event streaming application and then we'll see throughout this deep dive the different elements that come in and how Kafka makes a great event backbone. So generally, an event streaming application has the event backbone and then some event sources. So these could be from sensor data, they could be clicks on a website, they could even be an existing database, and we'll see that in the change data capture later. Then there's the option to do stream processing. So taking events off of this event backbone, doing some sort of processing, and then feeding that onto an app or even back into the event backbone and we'll see that through Kafka Streams. Systems like Kafka aren't designed to store events forever. So if you really want something that's going to be a persistent store forever of those events, then you're going to want to put them into an event archive. And then the other big element that moving to events gives you over being data-driven is this idea of notifications. So we're all used to having those notifications ping up on your phone, whether it's from Twitter or from WhatsApp. But notifications is something that you don't get in quite the same way being data-driven because an event really translates nicely into a notification. So these are some of the elements that we're going to be talking about today, but focusing around Kafka as the event backbone. Now, whenever I talk about Kafka, since I work at IBM, I always get the question around what is message queuing versus event streaming. So in IBM, we have IBM MQ, which is a message queuing system. And then we have IBM Event Streams, which is a fully supported Kafka. So that's event streaming. And so I like to always show this slide and give the differences just so everyone's on the same page. So a message queuing system has transient data persistence. So when you put a message onto a queue, as soon as it's read off, it's not on the queue anymore. So no one else can read that same message. It's generally more aimed for that targeted, reliable delivery. MQ has a lot of features built in to help with reliable targeting of sending a message to a specific person. And because of that, it's also often very request reply based. In comparison, event streaming provides stream history. So that's one of the big differences here. The events that go onto your event store, they stay there and they can be reread. This also provides very scalable consumption. You can have multiple different consumers at once and we'll see how that works in Kafka. And the data is immutable. 
So once the events are on the event store in that order, that's what happened. The event is a statement of something that has happened. It's not a message for someone to do something, so it should be immutable. So on top of these, the properties that you want in an event backbone are also for it to be scalable and highly available so that it supplies all of your needs. So this is where we bring in Apache Kafka. So Kafka is an open source distributed streaming platform and some of the key characteristics that it talks about is publish and subscribe to a stream of events, being able to store events in a durable way and processing streams of events as they occur. So you can see that matches up quite well to some of the properties that I had in the previous slide. One of the other really nice things about Kafka is it's a really rapidly growing community. So these are some pictures from some of the Kafka summits this year that I've been going and speaking at. Um, the picture at the top there is um, a big board that they had at Kafka summit in San Francisco with lots of the core contributors to Kafka. But all those names on there is just a tiny fraction of all of the people that have contributed to Kafka and everyone that makes up the community as well. So by looking at Kafka as your event backbone for all of your event-based applications, you're buying into this rapidly growing community that are every single day creating new ways to integrate with Kafka. So that's one of the really nice things. And you'll see that later when we talk about Kafka Connect as well. So first thing I'm going to do is show you a quick getting started with Kafka. So this is where we... Uh, pray to the demo gods that everything works. So if you haven't had a go with Kafka before, this is the first place to get started. This is where I always send people. This is the Kafka docs, kafka.apache.org, and they have a quick start page with a set of instructions to, to help you get started. So I've prepared this in advance. So we first have to start up a Zookeeper. So the first thing you have to know about Kafka is that you need Zookeeper. And that's the wrong command. I um, should be on this one. There we go. That's starting Zookeeper. The shell one you'll see later when I talk more about Zookeeper. So we start up Zookeeper. And hopefully it doesn't take too long. There we go. Uh, and then you have to start Kafka itself. And you'll notice here I'm running um, shell scripts and I've got some properties files. I haven't had to set anything up in advance here. Basically, when you download Kafka, it comes with some shell scripts to get started and some default config files. So that helps you to get started. Once I've started up both Zookeeper and Kafka, I might need a topic. So in Kafka, we store events in topics. So we're starting to introduce some terminology here. And I can originally just list to see what topics I've already got. The answer is none. So let's create one and we'll go into what some of these options are as we'll go through the talk. So this should create a topic of the name test and I've had to tell it um, yep, where Zookeeper is. So then I can start to produce and again just using a shell script getting started with Kafka is really really easy uh, and while that's running I will also start my consumer. So in the producer tab here, um, it's put me in place for me to start sending messages. Um, so I can say, hello, Devox. And then we see them appearing on the consume side. So getting started with Kafka is pretty straightforward. But we've already started to see some terminology that you have to know about. So we've seen topic. We've seen over here replication factor and partitions. So one of the nice things about Kafka is it is very configurable and I think that's really great, but it can mean that you have an initially uh, a bit of a learning curve. So. so let's dive in to some of the Kafka internals and how it works. So I'm going to focus first on the Kafka cluster itself um, and what you have to stand up to start up Kafka. So in my shell script, uh, when I ran Kafka server start, that was actually starting what's called a Kafka broker. And generally, you should run with three or more K 
Kafka brokers. And we'll see why as we go through how they work. But three is a good starting point. So for a particular topic in Kafka, it's broken down into different partitions. And the reason that we have this is we can then spread the partitions across the different brokers. And it means that if we have lots of applications that are wanting to send events to topic A, they're not all overwhelming one broker. They can talk to broker one, broker two, or broker three, and the events will go into the different partitions. So we can see straight away that Kafka has scalability built in because we have these multiple different um, partitions and we can run them across the different brokers. Kafka is also very highly available and it does this using replication. So for a particular topic and a particular partition, there is one broker which is the leader for that topic and partition. And then all of the other brokers are called followers. And what will happen is when you want to send events into that topic and that partition, you only talk to the leader for that particular one. So here, all of the Kafka clients, they go straight to the leader. But what Kafka will do is under the covers, it will actually be replicating all of this data across into the other brokers. So that means if for some, leader, so for some reason the leader was to go down, now... We haven't lost the data. It's already on the other followers. And what Kafka will do is have a leader election, elect a new leader for that topic and that partition. And then everyone just moves over and starts talking to that new one. So when you're starting to connect to Kafka, you will generally um, be able to talk to every single broker. And then Kafka will tell you which broker you have to come back to talk to. And that will be the leader. So that's fine, we've got leaders and followers, but what happens if this replication under the covers isn't keeping up? Well, that's what we call the difference between an out of sync and in sync replicas. So the leader for a particular partition and a particular topic will track at what point all of the followers have got up to. So it will know how far behind everyone is. And a replica is called out of sync if it hasn't requested a message in more than 10 seconds or it hasn't caught up to the most recent message in 10 seconds, where 10 seconds is the default value and you can change it using the replica lag time max MS. So that seems fine. You've got the difference between in sync and out of sync. And each partition also has a preferred leader. So when you initially create the partition, um, it will get assigned a leader and what Kafka will do is it will make sure that when all the partitions are created, the leaders are spread out across the different brokers. Of course, if leader elections happen because something goes down, that might change. But it's worth bearing in mind that initially they'll all be spread out. And we'll see later when we talk about running in production, what happens and uh, what challenges you can face if there's too many leader elections and you don't have all of your partitions using the preferred leader. So we've got this idea of replication, but what does this actually mean for you when you're running with Kafka? Well, this setting is a very important setting to know. It's, the, it's called min in sync replicas. And basically, this is declared by you as the number of replicas that must be in sync for a partition of the topic to be considered available. So it's up to you when you create the topic to decide how many replicas you're going to have and then what your min in sync replicas is going to be. And this has different effects. So if we say that we've got three brokers and the min in sync replicas is currently set to two, and we have a leader, and then we have one in sync and one out of sync, all of your producers and consumers can happily talk. They can create events, consume events, all fine. But the key thing is, if another one of your brokers goes out of sync, you now don't have that min in sync replicas of two. So the leader counts as one, and you did have another one, but now that's gone. What Kafka will do is it will prevent any of your producers sending events into Kafka. Consumers can still continue consuming what was there already, but the key thing is we don't want to get in a situation where the producer sends some more events into the leader, the leader goes down, and then suddenly you've got inconsistent events going on before it's replicated. 
So this is worth bearing in mind and it means your producers will get an error message back from Kafka saying that the min in sync replicas isn't high enough. It also, of course, means that if you set up your um, replicas and your min in sync replicas in a incorrect way, you could end up in a scenario where you can never send events into your topic. So you do have to make sure that you set these two correctly. Okay, so we've got all of our different brokers and followers, but there is one particular broker in Kafka which is given an additional role on top of potentially being leaders for different partitions, and that's the controller. So the controller is in charge of who's going to be the leader for the different partitions and telling them what they're doing. So it's a special broker that gets assigned and in order for only one controller to think that it's currently the leader, it uses Zookeeper to do that. So right at the beginning, I said the first thing you have to know when you're getting started with Kafka is the fact that you have to run both Kafka and Zookeeper. So let's have a look at what is in Zookeeper. So that's where I want this shell over here. So when you are running Zookeeper normally, if you say you're running it in a container, you can actually exec into the container and you can run something called zkcli.sha and that will allow you to then do commands on your Zookeeper. For Kafka, if you're running just locally, they provide this Zookeeper shell that you can use that does the same thing. So if I run that, it should connect to my Zookeeper. Here we go, it's connecting to localhost 2181. So all of these ports and things are just the defaults that get picked. And I can do ls slash. So this is my current Zookeeper tree. So you can see some of the things that are being stored in here, specifically the controller epoch, the controller, and also things like the brokers. So if I do a get on brokers IDs, actually I'm gonna do I'm gonna do ls first just so you can see what's in there. So you can see I'm only running one broker currently because I'm running locally and standing up more takes more time. <laughs> so if I do a get now on brokers IDs zero, this is one of my brokers. So when you're running the different, um, your more than one broker in Kafka, they all have to have a unique ID. Um, if you're interested in particularly around how that works, if you're doing persistence and things in Kubernetes, I'm doing a talk tomorrow about Kafka and Kubernetes, so feel free to come to that. But the key thing is when the broker starts up, it has this unique ID. You can see there's also other stuff being stored in here. So um, we've got some endpoints and things like that. But by storing on the Zookeeper tree, the information about that particular ID, Zookeeper will only know about the right number of brokers and they'll each have their unique name. We also have the controller in here. So if I get the controller, you can see here I've got stored which one is currently the controller. So it says version one, broker ID is zero, and then a timestamp. So that's the current controller. So what happens when a broker decides that it's going to be the controller? What it will do is it will try and write into this a node in your, cafe, in your Zookeeper tree. And assuming it writes successfully, then all's good. Basically, what will happen is the other brokers will then try to be the controller and try to do the same thing, but they'll see there's already an entry here, and so they say, fine. Now, of course, you could get a scenario where one of the brokers thinks it's the controller, the broker goes down, and it... Well, it doesn't fully go down, but it can't talk to Zookeeper for some reason anymore. At that point, Zookeeper then thinks there's nothing running as a controller, and you might have another controller come up and think that it's now the controller, another broker. And the way we get around that is there's this controller epoch. So you can see that controller epoch currently has a one. So what will happen is every time you get a new controller, it's counting up. And that's how you make sure that you don't end up with split brain and two different brokers thinking they're the controller at the same time, because whichever one has the latest number, that will then be the correct controller. So when you're starting to look at your Kafka and Zookeeper and understand what's going on, it's worth knowing how to look into Zookeeper and look at this tree and, and see what's actually happening under the covers.
So Zookeeper actually has an interesting history within the Kafka community. So those of you who keep up with the Kafka news, this might not be new news to you. But actually in previous versions, quite a lot of things talked to Zookeeper. So you might have noticed at the beginning, I actually made a slight error in the command that I ran to create the topic. I was pointing to Zookeeper, not Kafka. Um, and that's because actually all of the admin tools used to talk directly to Zookeeper to create topics and that kind of thing. And all of the consumers would also talk to Zookeeper to store their offsets. So we'll learn about offsets in a bit. But basically, we had all these different things all talking to Zookeeper. And that means if you're the person that's running Kafka, that can be a bit annoying because you're having to expose not only endpoints for Kafka, but also endpoints to Zookeeper externally to anybody who wants to use the system. So what the Kafka community have been doing is over time, they've been actually trying to move everything across. So this is what it currently looks like. We have something called an admin client, which runs alongside Kafka. And everything talks directly to Kafka and then gets rereached to Zookeeper under the covers. So you'll notice if you look at like previous versions of articles and things like that, often they might talk about being able to do commands directly to Zookeeper. That's actually now not the case with quite a lot of the commands. You have to go to Kafka and then Kafka will talk to Zookeeper if needs be. Now, um, the future plans um, is there's actually a KIP in process. So a KIP stands for a Kafka improvement proposal. And if you have a look on the internet, you can have a look at KIP 500. So basically, the plan going forwards is currently what's in Zookeeper is things around metadata. And uh, previously, we did have other data in Zookeeper, so some of the metadata for the consumers did live in Zookeeper. But what's been happening is the Kafka community has been moving everything across and storing things in Kafka Topics instead. So the aim of this KIP is basically to take any reliability that the Kafka itself has on Zookeeper away and use Kafka itself to store everything. And the main motivations for this are, A, it means that people don't have to maintain both a Kafka and a Zookeeper, which can be a bit frustrating. If you want to start with Kafka, the first thing you have to do is start up Zookeeper. But also, Zookeeper is a general use tool. It's not like perfectly designed for Kafka. It wasn't created for Kafka. It was there just in advance. So by moving this functionality across and putting it in Kafka, it means we can actually get to a scenario where it's all like custom built for Kafka. The way everything's stored works really well with how Kafka works and how Kafka, Kafka is going to work going forwards. So um, this KIP is currently still in progress. Um, I don't expect it to be in Kafka until sort of sometime next year, hopefully. Um, but there is a really good talk on this. So if you're interested more in like the journey that the Kafka community have been on with Kafka and Zookeeper, then I would highly recommend checking out the talk that was at Kafka Summit um, in San Francisco. All of the videos are online and it's called Kafka Needs No Keeper is the name of the talk. So I definitely have a look at that, but that's just kind of a high level overview of what's happening with Zookeeper and why if you look back at tutorials and things, there are changes between when you used to talk to Zookeeper and now at pretty much everything apart from the Kafka brokers, um, you talk directly to Kafka rather than to Zookeeper. Okay, so I'm now going to be uh, handing over to Andrew um, and he's going to talk about the producers and consumers in a bit more detail and tell you a little bit more about how the partitions work and what that does beyond sort of the basic scalability and how you make use of that in your producers and consumers. All right, hello everyone. So now Kate's familiarized yourself with the, in, uh, the actual Kafka cluster itself. I'm gonna to talk to you a bit more about the external clients that connect into this cluster to read data. Nope, that's not right. So we can get data into and out of Kafka. So first I'm gonna talk about producers. So producers essentially are what get your data into Kafka. A producer will send a record or an event to a given topic in Kafka to a certain partition. So a bit more about topics before we go into produce a bit more. So topics are an ordered sequence of logs of events and they are immutable. So this is important because we have our immutable stream history and we can replay it afterwards and we don't want 
any changes that occur to the stream. So producers publish logs to topics, and this is a monoto mon monotonically increasing um, sequence, and we call these offsets. So each log has an offset, or starts at zero and increments by one each time. These can't be changed after they've been produced. So how do you actually start a producer? So I won't demo this because Kate's actually shown you this already, but included with Kafka there's a console producer script and you can use this to quickly start up a producer and send messages. But if you want to do something a bit more in depth, producer has a Java API. So here we can see um, we create in a Kafka producer, we just instantiate a simple properties object and we add in all of our properties that we're going to use uh, for our producer. The most important one, important one here is the bootstrap servers config. So it's going to tell your producer where Kafka actually is. And these other properties are vary from security properties to how we're going to serialize our data, etc. And then we simply instantiate a null instance of the Kafka producer and then try to start it with these properties. And here's a couple of other methods that we want to use. So we can call produce with a given message. And this is just going to uh, give the producer the message and attempt to send it. So we call the Kafka producer dot send with the, with the record. And because it's a future, we call get to actually wait for the response to come back. And then we return it. And it's similarly a simple method, shut down, which is just going to shut down the producer and make sure it's flushed all of its messages. So it's not just a Java API. So librd Kafka is the underlying C library for the Kafka protocol. And this is what a lot of the other language clients are built from. So you can see here, Go, Node.js, and Python, some of the most popular ones. But they're not quite as developed as the Java API, because Java API has the admin client built in, which allows you to do all the admin operations for your cluster. So there's, these aren't the only ones that there are. There's about 10 or 15 of them. Uh, so chances are, if you're developing using a language, it has a Kafka library built in. Another thing to mention for producers is um, Spring actually have a Spring Boot starter for Kafka producers, so you can easily integrate this into your existing Spring app applications. Right, so back to producers. So every record that we produce has a key and a value. The value is the important part, so this is basically what you want to send to Kafka. This could be sensor data, a simple message, or maybe a log, or a transaction. And the key is optional. So you always have to have a value, but you can choose whether or not to have a key. If you don't pick a key, then Kafka will just append this log to the partition using its whatever scheme it's been configured to use. So by default, this is round robin. So if you produce a record to the Kafka cluster, it will ensure that, that the records are split between the partitions in a round robin fashion. However, you can be a bit more specific and specify a key. So what the key allows you to do is send records to a specific partition. So how this works is basically a hash of the key is created, and the partition that closely matches this hash is the partition that the, key, the record will end on. So here we've got a value and no key. So our, our lot records are just appended in a round-robin fashion. There's an equal number of records on each topic. However, if we specify a key, we can ensure that the records go to a specific partition. Oh, I'm pressing the wrong button there, I think. So now we can see that all of our messages that we've just produced have gone to the specific partition of zero. So while we're talking about partitions, I'm going to explain a few more in-depth concepts about them. So you might be wondering, how long do records persist in a topic? So for a given partition, we have a retention period. And this is basically how long logs stay in that partition before they're cleaned up by whatever, whatever means. So we can specify this in either time or in space. So if you perhaps don't care about your records uh, after a day or so, you can set your log retention minutes to be whatever a day is in minutes. Or you might have a certain amount of storage, so you can set your log retention bytes, so your records will expire after this has been met. So it's a good way to reduce the size of your uh, partitions if you don't care about certain parts of the data. There's also the concept of compaction. So here we've got a partition with records on it, and they've each got keys and values. You'll notice that some of the keys are the same, 
uh, but they've all got different values. So what compaction allows you to do is evolve the data store and only take certain records and dispose of other ones. So here we compact the topic and you can see that we now only have three records and they all have unique keys. So what compaction allows you to do is take the latest value for a given key. So here we've got key A, value A1, key A, value A2, and we only take the A2 value. So this is useful if perhaps you've got user information and you only care about what the latest action the user's done. Um, you can get rid of all the previous records for that key. So Kate mentioned uh, that the partitions are balanced across the brokers. So this ensures that when you produce two uh, Kafka brokers, the load is spread between the different brokers. However, sometimes your partitions can become unbalanced. So imagine you've got three brokers and you've got a partition on each, but then one of your brokers goes down, and while the broker's down, you, you create a new topic, and you want it to have three partitions. So in this case, you'd end up having two partitions on one broker, and one partition on the other broker. Then when your, other, your down broker comes up, that broker doesn't have any partitions for that topic. So rebalancing your partitions using the script that's built in with Kafka will allow you to evenly spread these partitions again across the brokers. So back to producers. What sort of configuration can we provide for producers? So there's an array of things you can do, but I'll go into some of the more important ones. So the most important one is the acknowledgement level. So this is what level of acknowledgement does the producer expect to receive from Kafka before considering a record to have been committed? So how does it know, how well does it know that the record has actually gone into the Kafka topic? So you can choose zero. Basically what this means is the producer won't wait for any acknowledgement back from Kafka to consider the record has been committed. So you might send a record uh, Kafka could or could not have committed it, but you would move on to the next one and keep producing. So it's risky because you don't know that it's the record's actually made it into Kafka, but the flip side is it's going to be very fast. You don't have to wait for any response back from Kafka. The middle ground is one, so we wait for the leader of a given partition to acknowledge that it's received the record. This is uh, sort of the middle ground. Uh, I think it's the default as well. Um, but the other end of the spectrum is you wait for all. So what this means is, Kate mentioned in-sync replicas. For a given broker, you have to wait until all the in-sync replicas have acknowledged that they received that record. So here we produce a record, it goes to the leader, the leader acknowledges, but we also have to wait for the replicas to acknowledge as well. Uh, so it takes a lot longer for the, day to com the reply to come back, but we can be sure that the record's actually made it into Kafka and that it's been replicated across all of the brokers. So you choose this setting if you actually cared um, about the data being persisted. Similarly, there's an option for retrying. So your producer could not retry. Uh, this might be suitable if you were, say, using an IoT sensor that's producing events, and it produces an event every second. You don't really care if uh, one second of data gets lost. So you might do this just to reduce the load in your system. However, if you really care about your record getting into Kafka, you can choose a given number of retries. So you might have this really high if you want to ensure that the record's got into Kafka, or you might just choose one or two, just to be safe. And we can also use idempotence. So basically this, this works by um, the producer sending a process ID and a mono mono monotonically, I can't say that word today, monotonically increasing a number with each record. So it will start with zero and send that to the broker. And when the broker acknowledges, it will send a combination of the process ID and the number. So the broker knows what acknowledgement it's getting for what message, so it won't send the same message twice. Right, so more config. We can batch records together. So a producer could send a record as soon as it's ready, or it can wait until it's got a few records together, batch them together, and send it all, as well, all at once. So this is useful for reducing network traffic. You might have just one set of packets sent across the network rather than a, a stream of packets. And we've also got compression. So 
we want to reduce the, the amount of data that's been sent across our network so we can compress the records and there are many different compression types available but here's gzip as an example so that's how you get data into your system using a kafka producer how about reading data from it this is where consumers come in so consumers uh, read records from a given topic and they you'll see in a minute that they can work in in parallel with each other to consume um, very scalably. So a consumer consumes from a given offset. Typically, your consumer would start at zero and then read up one, two, three, four, five, etc. But the consumer can, choo can choose to start reading wherever it likes. So the consumer A could come in and start reading from offset two. B could read from offset five. And the key thing to realize here is consumer doesn't actually mean the data has been consumed off the topic. The data remains on the topic the consumer reads it and makes a copy of it itself. This enables multiple consumers to read from the same topic at the same time, and it means you have your immutable log preserved. So it's not a transaction, it's a publish subscribe. You view the data and it stays where it is. And similarly to the producer, we've got Java API. I won't go through that uh, because it's basically the same as the producer. We have the properties object and then we instantiate the producer, the consumer, sorry. And the methods are very similar to the producer, however we've got this extra one, set or generate consumer group ID. So this is to do with consumer groups, which I'll go into in detail in a minute, but basically consumers can work together and they have the same ID, it means they're in a group and they share the load of consuming off the topic. Again, the same language is available for consumers. And we also have a Spring Boot template consumers as well. So consumer groups. Consumer groups are a way for consumers to work together to um, consume in parallel from a topic. So a consumer group, you have multiple consumers and each one consumes from a specific top, uh, partition of the topic. So you could have a consumer uh, consuming from the first partition, a consumer also choosing from the second partition. I'll show you an example so it makes sense. So in consumer group A, we've got three consumers, and they're all reading from different partitions, and they're at different offsets. So this allows them to consume in parallel, whereas if there was just one consumer, it would have to read from the first partition, then the second partition, then the third partition. So it's much faster. Consumer group B, however, only has two consumers in it. So when we split, try and split the load between the consumers, one of the consumers ends up with two partitions. So this isn't ideal. It's not going to consume as fast, and we have a, a larger point of failure in the second consumer. So ideally, you want to ensure that your consumer group can, contains as many consumers as there are partitions of the topic that you're consuming from. We can add another consumer to this consumer group, but right now it won't do anything because there's no extra partition for it to consume from. However, this is also useful because if one of our other consumers were to go down, this new consumer could pick up where the other consumer left off. So how do the consumers actually coordinate and know where each one's reading from and where the new consumers need to read from? So here we've got three brokers, and the way this works is there's an internal topic called consumer offsets. So basically all the Kafka internal topics have, start with a double underscore, so you don't want to create topics with those. So this topic has a leader, obviously, and say if it's broker zero. So in this case, the leader of the consumer offsets topic is, is said to be the group coordinator. And basically the consumers are going to commit their offsets to this broker. So committing their offsets means, where have I read up to? So say the first consumer has read up to offset seven, it could commit this to the group coordinator. So if that consumer were to die and a new consumer comes up, it can pick up where the other one left off. So the consumers consume and then they commit their offsets back to broker zero. So this allows us to add, and add new consumers in as other ones fail. So now talk about some config for consumers. So as, as I mentioned just then, yep. Why may, may we need uh, consumer groups? It's not clear. 
So the question was, why, why do we actually need consumer groups? So if you were having a single consumer consume from a topic uh, and there were multiple partitions, a consumer can only read from one partition at a time. So if it, re it has to read from all of them, then it has to do synchronously read from the first one, read from the second one, read from the third one. And that's going to take some time. And also there's the fact that if that consumer were to die, you're not consuming any records anymore. But if you have a consumer group with multiple consumers, you can split the load of the partitions between the consumers. So each of them consumes only one partition. And at the end of that, you've got the whole, every partition has been consumed within that group. So it's, it's scalability, uh, you can consume in parallel, and it's fault tolerance. If one of them is to die, you can start another consumer as well. So committing offsets is basically the consumer saying, I've read up to this point. And this can be automatic. So by default, um, I'm not sure what the default value is, but the consumer after so many records will say, I've read up to this point. The problem with this is commits might go faster than processing. So when a consumer consumes a record, it typically will perform some sort of operation on it. And that's called the processing. But if this processing takes a certain amount of time, um, the, the, you, this automatic committing might occur before you've actually processed the record. So say I consume a message and I'm processing it, but then I tell Kafka, right, I've read this, I've read this record. Then my consumer dies, when the new consumer comes back up, it's going to start at that point, but the message hasn't actually been processed. So you can do this manually, asynchronously instead. So now what the consumer is going to do, it's going to consume a record, start performing some processing on it, and asynchronously go and tell Kafka that it's consumed this record. Again, this is still risky because um, you could still not have processed the message by the time that you've acknowledged to Kafka that you've actually consumed it. So to be safe, you can do it synchronously. So now you're going to consume the message, process it, and then tell Kafka that you've actually finished with reading the message. So obviously it's safe, but it's going to be much slower because you have to wait until you've processed the message, and then you send Kafka the, the acknowledgement. So typically, you'll see offsets being committed on a timer. Uh, so every, say, 30 seconds, you'll commit your offsets back to Kafka. So any more questions about consumers? Cool. So the question was, uh, how do we scale if we've got a lot of records coming into a partition, but we've only got one consumer of the partition? So typically, you'd only have one consumer consuming per partition. But um, in that case, you just have to allocate more resources to your consuming app, because you can't have two consumers reading from the same partition if they're part of the same group. However, what you could do you could have multiple consumers who aren't in, in the same group, but then you're going to risk consuming the same message multiple times. So, sorry. so if my like, message to process it takes, say, longer time, 10 seconds, yeah. so that means I can read only every ten, one message every 10 seconds and there is no way to scale it? So in that case, if you were using synchronous, so what you were talking about there was synchronous committing of offsets, in that case, if you wanted to speed it up, you'd have to use one of the other methods. So if your processing takes 10 seconds, you would consider using maybe asynchronous manual instead to speed up the processing. It's a balance between what you actually want from your application. So next session I'm going to talk about is Kafka features which make it useful in production. So we've talked about the basics, we've talked about consumers and producers. What other features does Kafka have which make it so powerful? So Kafka has got built-in monitoring. Basically, the Kafka, the Kafka code uh, produces YAML metrics. So basically, it tracks certain operations that are performed in the code and exposes these via JMX. So Java management extensions, 
allows us to hook in external applications to access these metrics that Kafka is producing. So JMX runs at the JVM level, and you can hook into this using, say, a J console, or you can use more advanced external monitoring tools. You might want to use Grafana, for example, um, to plot some of these metrics. So what sort of metrics does Kafka actually give you? So here's some of the basic metrics that you get. So we can monitor how many bytes are going in. Are our, consume, are our producers uh, getting messages into Kafka? How much load is there? Is it too much load? How many bytes are we getting out? How many bytes are consumers pulling from our cluster? This allows us to tell if our consumers are actually working properly. An important one for monitoring under-replicated partitions. So if a given partition is under-replicated, this means that the replicas of the leader aren't keeping up with the load on that partition. So this might indicate a problem where too much load is coming into your cluster and your Kafka can't handle it. And again, network metrics, if you want to measure how much traffic is going through our network. So there's a variety of metrics that Kafka produces that you can hook into um, and analyze for your production systems. Another brilliant feature of Kafka is it's got built-in security. So you may or may not choose to use this in production, but it, it's useful nonetheless. So there are two types of security in Kafka. We have what we call internal communication, so this is communication between the Kafka brokers. So for example, replication um, and setting up partitions, the brokers need to communicate. And by default, they won't do this encrypted. But you can encrypt it if you like. And then we have our traffic going into Kafka. So we have producers, we have consumers, and also Zookeeper. This is external communication. And these two things can be configured separately in the Kafka config. So internal SSL. Before I start on this, I'll just say uh, SSL has been deprecated by TLS, but in the Kafka world, it's still referred to as SSL. So this might seem a bit confusing, but I will prefer to it as SSL. So this allows you to encrypt communication between your Kafka brokers. You can set this up simply by specifying the security into broker protocol setting and setting that to SSL. You'll have to provide certificates for your Kafka brokers, and you will also have to provide a trust store for each broker. So the reason for this is you have to add into the trust store the certificates of the other brokers so the brokers all trust each other. But once you've set that up, you're good to go. And you can also optionally, optionally enable uh, a certificate authority. So the advantage of this is if you trust, if each broker trusts the certificate authority, then it, every broker that has a certificate that's signed by that authority is going to be trusted. So if one of your brokers were to go down, for example, and need a new certificate, as long as it's signed by the certificate authority, the other brokers will trust it. So similarly, we have external SSL. So this is going to require all your clients to authenticate using TLS. Uh, this just requires a simple broker setting to require. And when every client connects, it must provide these properties. So it must tell, tell the client that it's using SSL. And we must provide a trust store and our password. Otherwise, Kafka will just re reject the traffic. So this is obviously useful. You don't want any old person producing into your production Kafka cluster, and you don't want any old person consuming your data from your Kafka cluster. So security enables you to lock it down, uh, and it's built into Kafka. Another thing that's built into Kafka is authorization. So in Kafka, you can enable simple authorization. And by default, this is done with access control lists. So it's quite simple. Basically, you have a list of given users and what actions they perform. So say we've got a user, Bob, he can write to topics, and that'll be written to the access control list. And you can write to this using scripts that are uh, provided with Kafka. And additionally, though, Kafka has various authorizer classes. So what you can do if you want, you can implement or extend these classes and provide those as a jar on the Kafka class path. So you could essentially um, have whatever authorization method you want uh, underneath the covers, rather than using the default Kafka. Because the default Kafka authorization is pretty simple. OK, so that's securing your Kafka cluster. Now let's talk about debugging your cluster. So the good news is Kafka provides very good logging functionality. I won't go through any logs, because they're quite long. But I'll talk to you a bit about the uh, internal workings of how it works. 
So Kafka being a Java project uses Log4j, which basically allows you to configure the logging for your application without having to change the code. So you do this by modifying a properties file. So in Kafka's case, this is log4j.properties. And this is also the same for Zookeeper, because that's also a Java project. So what this allows you to do is change the log level of various packages within Kafka to tailor it to what you want to actually see in the logs yourself. So in our log4j properties file, we've got our appenders and layouts, which basically say um, what we want the logs to look like. But more importantly, we've got our loggers. And our loggers tell you're allowed to specify a package and say what level of logging you want. So on the right, we've got all the various levels logging from off to warnings to trace. Obviously, you don't want everything at trace, or your logs are just going to be hundreds of gigabytes long. You want to tailor it so that only the packages that you're interested in have trace. So I've missed off the appenders here, but um, this is basically a, a sample of a Kafka log4j properties file with our various uh, packages with different levels of logging. So you can tailor this to your, to your own needs. So some useful debugging commands. So one thing you want to make sure is that your records in your Kafka cluster are actually getting into your topics. And Kate's shown you already that Kafka comes with a cons console consumer. You can use this quick and easy way to check that your records are actually on your topic. You can also check what consumers are connected. So the Kafka consumer group script, you run this, and this will tell you what consumer groups are currently reading from your cluster. This is useful because it allows you to actually check whether your clients are connected or whether they're hanging. Similarly, with producers, I mentioned that Kafka has a in monitoring built in with JMX. We can hook into that and see how many bytes are going into our cluster. So this allows us to tell if the producers are actually running. So what to look out for when you're running Kafka in production? So Kate mentioned minimum in-sync replicas. Um, basically, if your replicas aren't in sync with the leader, uh, your data's not being produced. Uh, your data's not being spread between the brokers. So if one of the brokers goes down, you're going to be in trouble, and your records might be lost. So under replicated partition basically means that the replicas for that partition aren't meeting the minimum in sync replicas. And this is bad because, as Kate said, um, data can't be produced to that topic anymore. So you're going to have a bit of a deadlock situation. And if you're offline partitions, they won't have any leader, so you can't produce to those. What warnings does Kafka give you? So you'll often see in the logs partitions going in and out of fully replicated state. This is normal, but if you see it a lot, it might be something to worry about. So basically, this is when um, you're having data go into your Kafka leader too fast for replication to keep up. But this might just be a sudden spike in traffic, and the replication might catch up after a while. What you need to watch out for is if the replication doesn't catch up, because then you need to perhaps give your Kafka more resources. Brokers can also restart, and garbage collection can run, which is going to affect your logging. You can actually run this command, which comes with Kafka, kafka-topics.sh, to check what under-replicated partitions there are in Zookeeper. So Kafka produces uh, metrics which you can monitor and set up alerts for. So what sort of stuff might you want to be alerting on? As I mentioned, one of the most important things is in-sync replicas. If our partitions aren't keeping up uh, with replication, then we're not going to be able to produce to our topics. So you might see something like this, not enough replicas exception. So this could be an indicator of fail brokers. You don't have enough network between your brokers. You don't have enough resources for your brokers. Basically, it's not a good state to be in. You need to do something about it. So what can you do about it? Ensure that leaders are preferred. So Kate mentioned that there's a preferred leader for each partition. And the preferred leader basically ensures that leaders are spread throughout your brokers in your cluster. You don't want a leader of every partition being on the broker zero, because then if broker zero goes down, you're going to have so many leader elections, and it's going to slow things down a lot. So you can um, do a preferred leadership election, and this will basically trigger elections in Kafka so that the leader switches to whatever the preferred leader is. You want to make sure that your partitions are evenly distributed across the brokers in your cluster. 
Otherwise, you might be in a situation where most of the partitions for a given topic are on a single broker. Uh, this isn't good because if that broker goes down, you're going to lose all of your partitions. You can reassign your partitions using the script built into Kafka to evenly spread them over your brokers. And you can also add partitions and consumers if you're seeing a topic isn't keeping up with the load that you're putting into it. Uh, you can increase the number of partitions and therefore get more consumers. What about Zookeeper? So there's this thing in Zookeeper called four-letter words. Basically, these allow you to query the state of Zookeeper. So you echo the four-letter word and netcat that to your Zookeeper. So here I'm echoing server, which basically gives me a full summary of the status of the Zookeeper server. And this is similar to what Kate showed you before by browsing the Zookeeper tree. We've got other commands. So are you OK is the basic. Are you running in an error state? So this is a quick and easy check to check if your Zookeeper is actually errored or not. NV, what environment is the Zookeeper running in? Stat is basically a short summary of the server command. And conf, what config is my Zookeeper been started with? So these are great tools for checking the state of your Zookeeper. But you can also, as Kate showed you, navigate the Zookeeper tree using the ZK CLI, which is built into Zookeeper. And this allows you to check the internal state of what Zookeeper thinks your Kafka is like. So this is what um, advertised listeners Zookeeper has for my broker one. And you want to make sure that this lines up with what Kafka actually has. If there's a mismatch, mismatch between the two, you might need to take some action. So. What if you find a bug in Kafka, or you want to contribute? So if you want to raise an issue with Kaf the Kafka community, you can raise a Jira, which is basically an issue management um, platform. And this is essentially when you've found some sort of bug, you could raise a Jira, and someone in the Kafka community will eventually look at it and perhaps fix it. Kate mentioned Kafka imp improvement um, proposals. If you have a feature that you want to suggest to the Kafka community to go into Kafka, you can raise a KIP. KIPs are basically for the more severe changes that are going to actually change how Kafka functions itself. And every so often, the Kafka community will meet up, vote on what KIPs actually go into Kafka, uh, and some of them don't make it in. So it's quite tightly regulated. Or if it's not such a severe change, you can just make a pull request in Kafka. And what will happen is Kafka has these things called committers, which are people who've contributed to the Kafka source code over a certain period of time, and they're sort of trusted people that review PRs and can actually add them to the, the source code. So you would need a committer to go and look at this and say that it's all right to put in. Right, so that's everything for running Kafka in production. So now we're going to take a 30-minute break. Uh, should we say we're back here at 11? Yeah. Thank you very much. If you do have any questions, you can always come ask in the break a little bit. But yeah, we'll see you at 11. OK, so let's get started again. Um, so before the break, we talked through the Kafka cluster itself, different ways to configure it, how to run producers and consumers. And as you may have noticed, there are quite a lot of configuration options and things like that. And so running your own Kafka cluster does come with overhead in terms of learning and in terms of actual day-to-day -day management. So there are plenty of ways to get somebody else to run it for you. So IBM, we have a fully uh, supported Kafka, both in an IBM cloud as a managed service, and then you can also run it yourself, but with support, um, with some additional value add capabilities. But there are also plenty of things um, out in the community. So for example, Strimzy is a Kafka and on Kubernetes based system. So that's an operator. Um, and if you want to know more about Kafka and Kubernetes, again, you can come to my talk tomorrow. But what we wanted to do is spend the second half of this talking about how to get data in and out of Kafka through other systems. So because you can get other people to run Kafka for you, um, actually a lot of your time might be spent in working out um, what data you're going to flow into Kafka from other systems and then being able to take advantage of the stream processing it has in Kafka Streams. So Andrew's going to start with Kafka Connect, and then I'll finish off um, talking about Kafka Streams, and hopefully, if it works, showing a demo of Streams as well. Cheers. All right, so let's start with Kafka Connect. 
So we've talked about producers, consumers and the actual Kafka cluster, but now we're focusing on this external part where how do we actually link Kafka to our existing external systems and integrate Kafka into our architectures. So this is where Kafka Connect comes in. Kafka Connect is a tool for scalably and reliably streaming data between Apache Kafka and other systems. Essentially this means Kafka Connect is a tool you can use to get data into Kafka from your external systems and take data from Kafka into your other external systems. So why would you want to use it? So Kafka Connect is focused on streaming data to and from Kafka. You can just pick it up and use it straight away, there's many open source connectors already. Um, so it's an easy way to get started integrating Kafka into your existing architectures. Oops. Okay. It also offers guarantees that are difficult to achieve with other frameworks. So Kafka Connect runs uh, on top of Kafka. It's built with Kafka by the same community that built Kafka. Um, so it works very closely with Kafka under the covers. So when you run it, it will create topics for you. It will interact with Kafka um, and basically ensure that best practices are followed by what you're doing in the app. So you don't have to worry about um, a lot of the things that you would have to worry about if you're using some other framework to do this. Also, built-in fault tolerance and scalability, so because it's interacting with Kafka under the covers, we use some of the features that Kafka offers so we can uh, make our connectors fault to tolerant and scalable. So this is the typical anatomy of a system that's using connectors. So we have our external system at the top and what we call our source connector. So the source connector basically links Kafka to an external system where data is coming from the external system, the source, and into Kafka. Conversely, we have the sync connector. So this is taking data from your Kafka cluster and sending it to some sort of external system. So source and sync, people often get them confused, so try and remember. Uh, as I mentioned before, so Kafka Connect is open source. There are over 80 open source connectors for you to just go and download and use as you want. Um, some of the key ones, Elasticsearch, JDBC, uh, HDFS, but there's so many of them there um, and basically you can just go and download them off the internet and run them. So it's unlikely that you're going to have to actually write your own connector but if you have a special use case you might want to consider doing that. So for most of you you're probably just going to download a connector and plug it in. So let's move on to a couple of examples of a use case of a source connector. So say I've got some sort of database uh, where I most of my applications are writing data to and I'm using it for the backbone of my application. But I want to be able to stream this data um, using client, uh, so clients can read from this and stream it. In comes Kafka Connect. So I can connect a source connector which takes data from my database and streams it into Kafka so that clients can scalably consume the data. And what about the sync? So I've got data in my Kafka cluster, but I want to take this somewhere else. For example, Elasticsearch. Maybe I want to search this data, which Kafka doesn't easily let you do. This is what Elastic is for. So we use a sync connector to take data from the Kafka cluster, stream it into Elasticsearch, where we can perform our searches. So as you can see, it's very powerful for linking Kafka to your existing architectures. How do you use it then? So when you download Kafka, you can see here in the libraries directory you've got loads of connect specific jars which allow you to actually run Kafka Connect out of the box and a couple of scripts in the bin which are to st for starting the different type of connect workers. I'll come on to those in a second. So when we start the connector, let's take the connect standalone script for an example. We provide our worker config, which is a connect worker where everything will run within and our actual connector config. So worker config, I'll come to that in a minute uh, actually and explain those in detail. So we start up our connect worker and then we start up our connector in that. So everything runs on the connect worker, all the processes within there are managed by the worker. And when a connector runs it's started to do a specific task. And when it actually finds that there's data that needs moving from source or the sync, it starts what we call tasks. 
So tasks are like the workhorses of the system. The connector starts them to actually perform the movement of the data. And the connector will spawn one or many. When you configure your connector, you can specify a maximum number of tasks. But you can increase this number to allow parallelization. So that's the different, uh, that's the layout of it all. But this is what we call standalone mode. So you notice there's one worker, uh, and everything's running within that. So this is easy to uh, easy to get started. You might, if you're just giving Kafka Connect a go, you could start up the standalone and start a connector in it. But obviously, for production reasons, this wouldn't work because you've got a single point of failure, and you're not um, scalable here. So this is where distributed mode comes in. So here we've got another script, which is in the Kafka bin, connect distributed. And for this one, we only provide the worker config. You'll see why in a minute. But the key here is we start multiple of them. So I'm going to start three distributed workers. So now, when I start a connector, it'll get allocated to a worker. So here I can start two connectors, which spawn their own tasks. But what Kafka ensures here is that the load is balanced between the workers, and it does this dynamically under the covers on its own. So here, we balance the tasks around the workers so there's an even spread, and the load is spread within the workers. So now, what would happen if one of our workers were to die? So the tasks that were the, sorry, not the tasks, the processes that were being executed in that worker now have nowhere to run. So these are orphaned processes. But what Kafka Connect will ensure is that these processes get allocated to your other workers. So as you can see, running in distributed mode provides you inherent fault tolerance. And when, this, when the other worker were to come back up, the processes would rebalance across these. So you've got standalone mode and distributed mode. Distributed mode is the one you really want to be doing in production. But you, you notice that I didn't start the... I'm not going to go back, actually. I didn't start the um, distributed connector with a, a connector config, only a worker config. And this is because you can provide it using a REST API, which I'll talk about more in a minute. So let's talk a bit about configuring our connectors. So there's a few important properties in the worker config that we want to look at. So obviously, there's where is my Kafka cluster, the bootstrap.servers. Where should I start my REST API, which I'll talk a bit more about in a minute. Where should I store my offsets? So as I mentioned, um, stuff will be stored in Kafka uh, on a topic that's uh, specific to Kafka Connect. So uh, all the Connect workers can maintain like what work they've done and where they are. If you're in distributed mode, you'll have to use a group ID. So similar to consumer groups, where consumers have a group ID, and that means they're all in the same group, with our um, distributed connectors, we have a group ID, and this ensures that they all work as part of the same group to perform the overall operation that the connector is trying to do. So as you can see, the worker configs are the more like abstract overall Kafka properties, whereas the actual connector configs are specific to the particular connector you're trying to use. So over here, connect.class tells you exactly what connector you want to run. So file stream source, uh, this is basically a connector which takes data from a file into Kafka. And this is one of the two connectors that are built in by Ka to Kafka by default. So you've got the file stream source and the file stream sync. They're out of the box. All the rest you'll have to download yourself. How many tasks should I use? I mentioned this before. So you can set a maximum number of tasks. And the rest of the config in here is connector specific config. So here I'm using the file stream connector. So I'm going to say what file I actually want to stream into Kafka. If you're using a sync connector, uh, you'll have to uh, specify a topic because the sync connector will have to write stuff back to Kafka so it knows what it's consumed. So I mentioned the REST API. So Kafka Connect actually starts with a REST API when you start it on whatever port you choose. And you can call any of these operations on the API. So anything from getting what connectors are there already to starting a connector. And at the bottom, this is linked to the Pagi Kafka docs of where this API is documented. So when I started my distributed workers before, I didn't supply a specific connector. I just supplied a worker config. This is because when you use distributed mode, you start the connector through the connect REST API. So I'll give you a couple of examples of how we can use the REST API. 
So I can do a simple curl to the connector plugins endpoint, and this will tell me exactly what connectors are running uh, in that worker. So as I said, we've got the ones that come with Kafka by default, the file stream sync, and the file stream source. You can also curl uh, a post. So here I want to start a connector, so I'm going to post with some content. I'm going to say the name of the connector I want to start. The config is going to be what class, what connector class I want to use. This is going to say what connector I'm actually going to start. And then the file and the topic are specific to that connector. So now I've started a file stream source connector. And if I curl the connectors endpoint, which tells me what actual connectors I have, I can see there that my connector has actually started. So some key considerations for connectors. Where should I run my connector? So you don't want to run your connector in the same place as you're running your Kafka. Because what happens if that server goes, then you've no, got no Kafka and no connector. So what you want to do instead is run it somewhere else. And a good place to do that is in a Docker container. Because um, Connect uses its REST API, you can interact with it through that port. So here I'm simply pulling from Kafka, adding in my config, and starting with the scripts. And you'll notice that um, we're building from Kafka. This shows that um, Kafka Connect is actually runs on the, exactly the same classes as Kafka does itself. Another thing to consider is partitions. So here what I'm going to do is I've got a file. I'm going to use the file source and file sync connectors. And we've got some content in the file. And it's numbered 1 to 6, which are the different parts of the file. And it, that's in order. And I'm going to use a source connector to connect that to Kafka to a topic with two partitions. And if you start the source connector, the file stream source connector, by default it will use um, it will put the records in in this order if you use it in standalone mode. So you can see we've got the odd numbers in the first partition and the even numbers in the second partition. Now if I use the corresponding sync connector, the file sync connector, in, in standalone mode, you can see that the data's got all jumbled up. So this example just illustrates that before you run Kafka Connect in earnest, you actually have to understand exactly what's happening with your partitions. And if you're using standalone or distributed mode, it's good to think about things before you just get straight in. Another thing to consider, data formats. So obviously, you won't have the same data format across all of your systems. You might have a database that has a certain data format, and Kafka might not be able to represent this itself in a Kafka format. So you use these things called value converters. So we've got our external system format, our Kafka record format, and the internal Kafka format, which is basically Java objects. So your connector might need to specify a way of getting data from your external format into the Kafka internal format. So this isn't always necessary. Normally, you can just do it straight off. But sometimes, for example, this one with the MQ connector, we have to specify our own specific builders, which tell Kafka Connect how to transfer the records from one format to another. And on the other end, this is required. We need to get the data from Kafka internal format to how we want to actually store it in Kafka. So typically, the three that you would use are byte, string, or JSON, depending on how you want your data to appear on your Kafka topic. So where can you actually get these connectors from? So this is the IBM Event Streams uh, connector catalog. So this contains connectors which aren't specific to IBM Event Streams. You can run these on your Kafka anywhere. So you can download your connectors from there. So I mentioned that you probably wouldn't have to write your own connector because um, there's so many out of, out of the box that you can just download that are open source. But if you do, I've got a couple of slides to illustrate how you would do that. So Kafka Connect, it's an open source Java API for implementing connectors. Here you can see we've got the source and sync connectors. And if we wanted to uh, create our own connectors, we, all we'd have to do is extend these classes and override certain methods. Uh, and we could do that simple, with a simple class, bundle this up into a jar, and then when we start our worker, we, we configure it to use this jar, or we can use the REST API to add the jar to the worker. And so it's on the class path. And now, when a worker actually runs, 
when actual connector runs in this worker, it can make use of the jar that is on the class path. So we've got our connector plugin and the actual connector running on the worker. So as you can see, Kafka Connect provides an easy way to get Kafka connected to other pieces of your architecture. Uh, and it also allows you to write your own connectors if you've got a very specific use case. Another thing worth note, which I'm going to talk about, is change data capture. So change data capture identifies and captures the changes to a data store. And we can do this as a stream of Kafka events. So let's look at the scenario where you have a master database and you want to get data out of this using an application because you need to move this data to different places. So you might have an audit log. So you're replicating data from your master database to an audit log using some application. You might also want this data in a recovery database. What if your database was to go down? So you want to replicate data across with the same application. You might want to query cache so you can query your database more quickly. Again, we can move this over with some application. So the problem here is that if this application were to go down, everything stopped. There's a single point of failure. And you're reading directly from your master database, which might make it perform more slowly. So here you can use Kafka. So it's decoupling uh, the two sides of the system. Kafka replicates from the master database using change data capture. Whenever an event is put into the master database, it's replicated onto Kafka using Kafka Connect. Um, and now all your other end of your applications can just link directly into Kafka, which we know allows for scalable consumption. So there's different approaches for generating the changes that go into Kafka. The data store can drive these changes. Uh, you can repeat queries with optimizations or restrictions, or as most of them work, the log scanning. So that's the way to look for changes in your database and make Kafka aware of it. So why would you want to use Kafka with CDC? So you know from what I've just told you that Kafka has lots of connectors to other systems. There's over 80 of them. There's probably one you can find for anything you want to use it for yourself. And it acts as a buffer. So rather than reading directly from our database, we can just interact with Kafka um, scalably and easily. Publish subscribe instead of point to point. So multiple clients can do it in parallel. And it allows ease for the clients to process uh, the records as a stream of events. All right, that's it for me on connectors. So now Kate's going to talk to you about Kafka streams. OK, so we've talked about the Kafka cluster itself. We've talked about producers and consumers. And of course, when Kafka started out, that was all we had, was just simple producer consumer. And then we've got all of these different connectors that you can run. And you can go, as Andrew said, to our connector catalog to have a look, download some, and have a go at them as well. But I'm going to be talking about stream processing and how you can do that with something called Kafka Streams. So I'm going to start by defining what I think an event stream is, because if you uh, look at Kafka as a distributed streaming platform, you might think, well, actually, why have I got both Kafka Streams and I've got all of these producers and consumers? And hopefully, by the end of this, you'll see why Kafka Streams has things built on top that you wouldn't necessarily do with your basic producers, consumers. It's very similar to the Connect. So in the same way that you probably could write a connector to pull from a database or whatever into Kafka or vice versa, just using a normal producer and consumer, Kafka Connect builds on top of Kafka. It uses some of those things around fault tolerance that are built in to give you a better experience. And basically, the Kafka community have used their experience to build something so that you can get started really quickly. Kafka Streams is a little bit different in that, unlike with Connect, where you can just run a shell script, run a REST command, and you're done. Kafka Streams, you do have to write a little bit more code. But again, it's making use of that underlying. So here, when I'm talking about event streams, 
and this is what you would use Kafka streams for. It's an abstraction representing an infinite and ever-growing data set. And actually, if you think about it, that's quite a lot of different data in the current world. So Kafka was originally created as part of LinkedIn before they open sourced it. They have an infinite and ever-growing data set every time somebody clicks on the website on LinkedIn. Uh, Twitter is a good example of this as well, all of that data. So it's really, um, that's what we define when we're calling an event stream. And you can flow data through Kafka that isn't an event stream, but if you are flowing an event stream, then Kafka streams might be something to look at. Generally, characteristic-wise, it's ordered, it's immutable records, so obviously that makes sense for Kafka, and if possible, replayable, um, because that means that you don't have to process the events exactly as they arrive, you can wait and process things that happened last month or whatever, which from a processing point of view is really useful, because if I wanted to do some new processing on some new data going forwards, I could potentially train it or test it on old data. And so particularly for machine learning, um, having replayable data that you could use as like training data is a really good idea. So stream processing is the ongoing processing of one or more events in this event stream. So what is Kafka streams specifically? So it provides a processor API, so that's quite low level. And then a streams DSL built on top, and I'll kind of explain what that involves in a minute. The key thing here is Kafka Streams is Java-based. So with the connectors, you can just run your shell script and um, your REST API. So it doesn't really matter what technology you're using apart from that. At the moment, Kafka Streams is only a Java-based library. Whether they'll introduce other languages, I'm not sure. At the moment, within Kafka itself, Java is the only language that is built into the actual release. So anyone who would develop an equivalent for a different language, every time there was a new version of Kafka, they would have to go and update it separately. Whereas when you get a re new release of Kafka, you automatically get a new release of Kafka Streams because, again, it comes built in. So all of the jar files are in your normal Kafka download. One of the key things that is different about Kafka Streams versus other stream processing technologies is that the processing happens in the app. So Kafka Streams provides these APIs for you to write a Kafka Streams app, and all of the processing is happening in that app. You don't have a separate processing engine running. So that's one of the advantages of running with Kafka Streams. It also supports per record processing. So if you're looking at different technologies, it's worth having a look at whether things um, are actually been doing exactly per record or whether it's actually batch processing because true stream processing is processing every record as they appear, not necessarily doing it in batches. So it's worth bearing that in mind and having a little look. Um, so I've sort of said this a little bit already, but it stores the state in Kafka, and we'll see a little bit more how it does that um, when I do the demo. Um, so this allows for stateful processing. So Kafka is a good place to store state, so we may as well make use of it. And because it's making use of Kafka um, and all of the nice things that we've talked about this, um, earlier today, then it allows it to be scalable and also very highly available as well. So the processor API allows you to then pretty much build any processing app that you want, but it does mean that you have to probably write quite a lot of Java code. So the Streams DSL is designed to allow, to give you abstractions so that you can very quickly write Kafka Streams apps with a very small amount of code. So an example of one of the abstractions that it gives you is called KStream. So you can see here it's an interface, that's just from the Java doc, and a case stream represents an abstraction of a record stream of key value pairs. So if you remember earlier, all of our records in Kafka are a key value pair, so this is a stream of them coming in. And in your Java code, the way you would instantiate a new case stream is either directly from one or multiple Kafka topics. So there is a function that allows you to say, take all of the records that are coming from this particular topic, 
put them in my case stream object. Or you can perform a transformation on an existing case stream or some other object and have the result be a case stream. So case stream is one of the ones that you will definitely come across if you're using the DSL because that's how you get data off Kafka initially and then put it back on again at the end. The second one that I want to talk about is Ktable. So we're seeing more and more, particularly with um, sort of architecture choices like CQRS, that a lot of people are wanting to get data from a database and then interact with it in a more event-based way. So a Ktable here is an abstraction of a change log stream from a primary keyed table. So if you think back to the Kafka Connect with the change data capture, what that was doing, so technologies like Debezium is a project that has all sorts of different databases that does CDC. If you run those connectors, they will basically create a stream of records that each represent that change in a table. So whether that's a create, update, delete, whatever it is. And so you can represent that inside your Kafka Streams app using a K table. Again, you can pull it from a single Kafka topic. So if your topic is already set up to be that change log, then that's what you would do. It can also be created as the result of a K table transformation. So calling some function on existing K table. And then finally, by aggregating a K stream. So for example, doing things like joins from multiple different K streams, you would potentially end up with a K table. So what I'm going to do is show you a sort of visual example and then uh, we can start looking at more substantial examples with actual um, code as well. So at a more conceptual level, this is the kind of thing you can start to do if you run Kafka Streams apps. So say I've got an input topic here. I've got my key and values. Um, and for now, let's just assume I've only got one partition, so they're all just on the same partition. Um, so I've got foo red, bar orange, foo yellow, bingo green. So you can see I've got a few different keys there um, and all sorts of different values. With just four lines of code, I can then process this stream and have this result at the bottom. So you can see here that we're already starting to see the case stream come in. So I've done a builder.stream from my input. So that's the name of my input topic. I've then done a filter. So I'm filtering the key and values, and I'm basically saying I'm only going to pick any record that has a key equal to bingo. So that will be the fourth one along and the fifth one along. So at that point, I've now got an internal case stream that looks like that. I'm then going to map that and update the key and the value. So I'm keeping the key the same, so I'll still get bingo at the other end, but I'm uppercasing the value, and then I'm putting all onto an output topic. So that's how I get those two events there. As you can see, it looks like quite nice sort of functional type Java. So it has, because Kafka Streams is f more recent, um, it favors this kind of writing of your Java code. And that transform, although but you could say we're straightforward, actually, in terms of the amount of code that you have to write, because we're using the DSL and we're being able to make use of the case stream and all of the functions that come along with it, it's a very short amount of code to do something nice and quick and easy. So I'm going to look at two specific examples. Um, and these are taken from the Kafka docs. So if you go have a look at the Kafka Streams docs, um, there's a tutorial to help you write an app, and there's a few different ones. Um, but hopefully this will give you a, a better example of um, how to run them and what you might do in real life and what's involved. Um, so when you first come to write a Kafka Streams app, the first thing you have to work out is what is my topology going to look at? look like. So the first app that we will have is a basic pipe. So it takes all data from this input topic and puts it to this other output topic. So not very exciting, but it's a good first step. And so we just have two topics involved. We have the input topic and the output topic and the data will flow between and the app's running somewhere in the middle where the black line is. Now, the nice thing about running on Kafka is, of course, the fact that we have um, partitions and everything. So what I could do is 
between these two topics, I could have multiple of the same Kafka streams app running and they would take one partition each and each of them between them would then get um, all of the events and they would flow out to the output topic so I wouldn't end up with any duplicates on my output but I could get better scale. So that's where you see that actually because Kafka Streams is built into Kafka, it's making good use of Kafka, you can already start to imagine that you can scale at this point. This is the second app that we're going to look at. I'll show this now so that I don't have to switch back and forth. And this one's going to be a little bit more complicated. So this app is doing a word count. So we'll have an input topic that has a set of records that have one or more words in each record. I'm going to lowercase them, split them into different words. So we only have one word. And then we're going to repartition them onto the topic and then count. So the reason that we do this and the reason why it's worth you know, thinking about how you're building up your topology is again we can make use of the way Kafka do thing, does things and understanding the Kafka partitions to then make our Kafka Streams apps run even faster. So it doesn't make any sense to have um, a, for a particular event for one app to read it, lowercase it and then give it to somewhere else or it, the lowercasing splitting makes sense to do that all in one go. But at the point where we have all of these different words, if we had more than one Kafka Streams app running, at the point where they've lowercase and split them into words, they've now all got different, like a mixture of the different words, potentially. So what you can do is get Kafka Streams to repartition the topic. So you put onto a new topic and basically what you would end up with is on each partition, you would have one or more of the same word. So if I've put hello in five times, by the time we get to this repartition topic, all of the words, all of the records with the word hello are all on the same topic. Then we have different Kafka Streams apps that are running for an output. So this means that I could do this then. So again, my Kafka Streams apps, I could have multiple ones of them running. They get a partition each because of consumer groups, they can work nicely together and the first one could read all of the hellos, the second one the worlds and the last one the highs and then they could do the count. There's little databases here, so what's actually happening is whenever I've shown a blue box, data is going back onto a new partition, but the green boxes is basically local state just because from a performance reason it doesn't make sense to put it in the topic. So Kafka Streams makes use of both actual topics for storing the state but it also makes use of the local storage as well just within the app. Before I go across and show the demo the last thing I want to say is just um, this diagram kind of shows the topology that you build up as part of your app. Actually from a Kafka Streams perspective what you would do is write one app that has this topology and then you can run multiple versions and because you're using Kafka Streams under the covers, this is kind of what it will be doing and it will be, if you run multiple of them, they'll coordinate together to get the data through. So although I've only drawn the multiple boxes at the point of the repartitioned, you could have multiple apps running from the input topic as well, getting a word lowercasing it, splitting it, and then putting it onto the topic, and you can have multiple at that point. But you don't have to worry as much about all of this, how you're coordinating it. You just run multiple Kafka Streams apps with the same ID, and Kafka Streams does it for you. So let's have a look at some Kafka Streams apps. So this is uh, where I talked about getting started. So if you go to the documentation and click Kafka Streams, here it is. So you, there's a demo app and then the tutorial specifically that I'm going to be talking about is this one, tutorial write an app. So you can see you can get started with just generating from the archetype and then there are three different examples, line split, pipe and word count. So I'm going to show pipe and word count. So let's switch to pipe first because that's simpler. So here is the code for pipe. 
So there's a few different things that we do when we start writing our first Kafka Streams app. This one's a quite basic example. You can see the code's not massive, um, but there are a few things that we would have to do in every single Streams app to set it up. So a Kafka Streams app is written in a very similar way to the producers and the consumers that we saw earlier. The first thing you have to do is create a properties object, which is a standard Java utils properties. And in my properties, I'm first going to put a application ID. So this is how I tell Kafka Streams which apps are the same apps that are going to work together. So in this case, this is going to be called Streams Pipe. Makes sense. Um, and the key thing is actually, so Kafka Streams will see in the next example, will start to create its own topics to handle stuff under the covers. And it will use this as a unique name. So you want to make sure that this ID is unique um, within your cluster for your streams apps. Again, you have to tell it just like your producers, consumers, and connect where to find Kafka. Localhost 9092 is the default. And then you have to provide some deserializers and serializers. So we haven't really touched on this because when you create consumers and producers, people don't tend to think about it quite so much. But when you're using Kafka streams, you quite quickly have to think about it as soon as you go off the beaten path of doing strings everywhere. So in Kafka, um, there is a default class called certes.java which is serializer and deserializer. That's where it gets its name. And that provides a set of sort of standard deserializers and serializers for Kafka for the standard types. So here you can see we're using string and we have to provide two. So we provide one for the key and one for the value. This is something you provide as part of your producers and consumers as well. So you can actually have a different um, like type for your key and your value in all of your records that don't have to match. So I have to tell my Kafka streams what it's supposed to be doing when it's reading and pushing events um, from Kafka. It has to know how to serialize and deserialize. Those are all my properties. And then I create a streams builder. So this is going to create my first K stream. So you can see here, I've got K stream source equals builder dot stream. Very similar to what we saw earlier, my input topic is streams plain text input. And then my um, what I'm going to do is just do source dot two that writes it back um, streams dot pipe dot output. So that creates a streams builder object. From there, you have to create your topology, which was the diagram I saw earlier. So you can create the topology just using builder dot build. It's quite nice to print out the topology um, in probably you wouldn't normally do it in a system.out.println, but in your log or somewhere, because then you can actually see what topology it's built. And then you can start it. And the code here at the bottom is just so that it runs continuously. So that's my app. Let's have a go at running it and see what happens. So I already created uh, some topics earlier in the break. So you can see I listed them here. So we've now got a new one, streams pipe output and streams plain text input. So if I want to produce, um, I now need to produce to a new, is that gonna go at the top? There we go, to a new topic. So I'm going to start by producing to streams pipe, uh, no, streams plain text input. That is my new topic. And the console producer will then allow me to set a bunch of text when it runs. There we go. So we can do similar to what we had on the other topic I created earlier. Hello, DevOx. Maybe one with um, space in between. How are things? Maybe hi again. So we've got that producer there. Now, if I run my consumer... Oh. What are you doing? Hang on. There we go. Right. So I've added a new um, property to my consumer. So earlier when I was running the consumer, we ran from beginning. So that means it will pick zero as the offset all of the time, because by default, if you just stand it up, it will go from the end. I've also put in this property of print key. The reason I've done that is because by default, if you run the console 
consumer, it won't print out the key. Now, for this example, we maybe don't care about the key, but if I was doing the filtering example, we would care, and we will care in a minute for the word count one. So my topic I'm consuming from is this one. Like that. Hopefully that hasn't confused itself. Cool, okay, so that should be consuming. So I need to actually start my pipe. So I can just run it from there. So you can see the first thing that happens is it's printed out the topology. And the topology is pretty straightforward. We've just got our source. And you can see it tells you, this is really handy, it tells you exactly what topic is going to be created under the covers. So in this one, it's created a topic, or it's not created a topic, but it's using a topic called Streams Plain Text Input. I created the topic already. And then it's going to be pushing it to the topic of streams pipe output. So this topology is really straightforward, but we'll see in the word count one that printing out is very useful. And I haven't configured LS4J properly, but that doesn't really matter. So then in our consumer, you can see all of the data has come through. We've got hello DevOps, hi there, how are things, hi. So that's all good. Uh, and that's our basic pipe. So writing a pipe based um, Streams app is pretty straightforward, but not particularly exciting because Kafka allows you to have multiple consumers. So why you just wouldn't create multiple consumers on the same topic, I don't know. So let's look at one that's more interesting. So this is word count. So word count, again, this is an example that is in um, the docs. This time I'm going to have a different uh, config. So streams word count. And this time we will see it creating intermediary topics. So it didn't need to for my pipe, but for this one it will need to. Again, I've provided localhost 9092 and I've provided the key and value um, of certes for string. Now this serializer deserializer at this point is the default value. So unless told otherwise, Kafka streams will assume that this is what it has to use for everything. And then I'm going to create my streams builder, similar as before, create the case stream. And then here I'm going to do the same input, so streams plain text input. And then this is where we have some more exciting code. So uh, I'm going to lowercase the values, split on white space, and then flat map them. So this is what I'm doing here. So hopefully a lot of you are familiar with reading this kind of code, but I'm... Um, going to flat map the values, I'm doing arrays as list, lowercasing the value and splitting it. If I don't do the flat map, basically what will happen is for every record, I will end up with a list with the individual words. So I would still have multiple of them, but because I actually don't care which ones came in on which record, I want them all to be sort of flat mapped. So that's the reason for using that. Then this is doing the group by, so I'm saying I'm going to group by the value. So basically the value at this point will be whatever word it was, and it will be a single word because of the flat mapping a minute ago and the splitting on white space. So we've got this single word and basically what we're going to end up with after the group by line is we will have lots of records where they have a key of the word and a value of the same word. And that will all get put onto a new um, topic. And you can see here there's another example of one of the abstractions that Kafka Streams provides. So we've got a k-grouped stream there. Then we're going to do the count. So call count, we say as count store. So that's basically telling it what local store to use. That's not a new topic, it's a local store. And at this point we've got a k-table. Because we've got a k-table, um, we want to actually convert that back to a stream to send it on. So I could do other k-table type transformations at this point, but I'm not. I'm going to just do a to stream, and then I'm going to send it to the stream's word count output. Now, count, you can see here, gives you a k-table with a string and a long. So in this case, you, so here, using IntelliJ is kind of helping me to see what's going on, which is quite nice. So the reason it's got a long is because obviously if you do a count, it makes sense for it to be a long. When I've converted it to a K table, to from, from a K table, sorry, to a K stream, I've still got string and long. So my key is a string and my value is a long. Now at the top, I told Kafka streams it had to use string. So if it then tried to send that value into Kafka, 
it would basically give me back an error saying oh, I don't know how to serialize this object. So what I can do is actually within the code of my Kafka stream itself, I can then tell it what type to use. So I could, of course, have at this point done a two string on my count, but in a lot of places, you're not going to want to two string something before you send it up to Kafka. So it makes sense to do it like this and have a default value at the top and then on the specific line where you want to override which deserializer serializer it's going to use, you can do it there. So this two is slightly different to the pipe one because I not only give it the topic that I want to write to, I also do this produced with serdy string and then serdy's long. So first one being the key, the second one being the value. You'll find with everything in Kafka it goes key then value. Again, I'm going to print out the topology and then I've got the same code at the bottom that just sort of starts it up um, this way. So I do should already have, yes, I've already created the word count output topic. Um, I've already got a producer running, which is pointing at streams plain text input. Um, and what I'm going to do is actually just restart this one pointing at my streams word count output. There, and at the moment it won't have any data because nothing's running. I probably need to... Uh, stop my pipe from running. Although, we might be able to just run it in the background. Let's find out. Um, yeah, it's quite happy to run both. Um, I'm just going to kill the pipe while we're here so we don't tempt fate. Right, so here we've got a much more interesting print from our system out of our topology. So you've got two actual sub-topologies going on here you can see. So the first one goes from stream plain text input. So that's the one I've already created. I know about that topic already because I created it. You can see that we're going to be doing a flat map of the values and then we've got a bunch of sort of processor steps before it goes to the sync. So this is doing um, key selecting and filtering. So you can see actually I only had like one or two lines of code at this point because I had the flat map values and the group by but under the covers it's doing quite a lot of different stuff and that's the nice thing about using these abstractions and it ends up in something called the count store repartition then in topology 2 I've got count store repartition going to count store um, the, which is just an internal store. So here's the difference. I've got topics here. So that's a specific topic in Kafka. This is just a store. So it's not a topic in Kafka. And then it goes to the streams word count output. So I've got um, my events there. And you'll notice it hasn't printed a key. And that's because of the deserialization. So by default, my console consumer is assuming the types are all string. But nicely, there are quite a lot of configuration options. So I have got one somewhere, because I can't remember this off the top of my head. There it is, um, where I've added the deserializer. So this is actually wrong, because it should be key deserializer, not value. No, it is value. Yes, it is value. I'm talking nonsense. So the key is still a string, because it's the word, and then the value. So here, what I've actually got printed out at the top there is all of the keys. And if I had just printed the value, so I've added this new thing that says property print key. If I didn't have that, I would just get loads of blank lines. If I then run it again with the deserializer, assuming I have put the right one in, it should just print everything out. Oh, no, because I haven't got the right topic. Hang on. So this is why deserializers is worth being aware of how they work. Streams, word count, output. There we go. That should then work now. There we go. So you can see the counts there. So basically what we've ended up with is a set of records in our topic where the key is now the word and then the value is how many of them there are. And to get to this point, I had to know that um, I was going to end up with a long at the other end. Now, this is nice, it just sort of turns up, but it's also good to have a look at actually what's happening in between. So I'm going to create a different consumer. If I now do my topics list again, which is this one, you'll see there's a new topic that has turned up when it runs. 
There we go. So we've actually got two new topics. We've got a change log and a repartition. And if you remember a minute ago in here, I was looking at what topics it's been created. So count store repartition has been created by Kafka Streams itself. So you need to be aware that if you're going to start using Kafka Streams, it will randomly create topics for it. Well, not randomly. It will on purpose create topics for it to use. But the point is that you will get these extra topics appearing. So it's worth being aware of it, particularly if you've got things in place like turning off the auto create of, partition of topics. So what we can actually do is have a go at consuming from this one. We don't need the deserializer anymore. I'm going to leave the key though. And then instead of um, the topic that we had before, we're actually going to use this new repartition one to see what happens if we consume. And so we're doing from beginning. And I'm going to uh, throw a few more events in here. Uh, let's, let's duplicate some of the words. So you can see what we've got in that repartition one is exactly what you would expect which is that we end up with the key and the value being exactly the same. So that then in a minute, when we um, want to actually do the count, we could have multiple different Kafka Streams apps running and they could read the different um, ones based on the key and um, process that particular one to see how many events have turned up. Um, and you'll notice that these are, that's not actually every single word. Um, and that's because this new topic that's been created, it's been created with the um, compaction on. Um, so, but you don't have to worry about that because basically the key thing is Kafka Streams is doing things for you under the covers and putting things onto the topic. The thing that's worth bearing in mind with all of this um, is if you are looking at your Kafka Streams apps and you're saying, actually, we're getting quite a lot of latency between one end and the other, there is other things going on under the covers. So first, have a look at your topology, work out what topics are being created under the covers, and then have a look at the other topics. And you can consume from them. It's not disruptive in any way because you can run a consumer quite happily. And then what you can see is start to look at, okay, how long is it taking me to get the events to here, to there? Um, what is it that I can change? The other thing that's worth bearing in mind is this property set here is just a fraction of what you can set. And actually Kafka Streams will let you edit the underlying producer consumer config. So if there's particular producer and consumer settings that you want to change to improve latency and things like that, you can do that from your Kafka Streams app. That is perfectly fine. So that's the word count. You can see we've got all of this data flowing through quite happily and it comes out the other end. But we do have to remember about our deserializers. Cool. So let's go here. So I think Kafka Streams can take a little bit of time to get your head around what's happening where. So I just wanted to place the diagrams back up um, against the points here to see, so you can sort of map back and forth. So we created our new streams builder, we do a build.stream, that's pulling from that input topic. So that's the point in time which we're actually talking to Kafka. The lower casing in the splitting to words is all done within the Kafka streams app itself. It's not talking out to Kafka at that point. Um, and you can see the function there. There is probably nicer ways to write that piece of code, but that's the example that they gave, so I thought I'd stick to it. So it looks familiar if you go have a look at the examples. Um, if you've read the definitive guide to Kafka book, which I would highly recommend, there is, a, there is a sort of slightly different version of this example. So it does the same thing, but it's slightly different. They've just laid out slightly differently and they're removing the word there and things like that. Then you do the group by. So at this point, you're... Um, whether knowingly or not, creating a new topic under the covers and it's going to repartition all of that data. And then you do the count to the stream and then back out the other end um, to your topic. So the nice thing is you haven't had to think about storing the repartition topic, but if you had uh, processed a word and it ended up on the repartition topic and then your Kafka Streams app dies, when it comes back up, it can just carry on from the repartition topic. So by using the Kafka topics under the covers, it's getting all of that sort of resiliency and that kind of thing. 
So, uh, to review Kafka Streams, um, I would highly recommend just starting with the Streams DSL because that makes it really easy to get started. As you can see, you can do fairly complex um, processes or processing of events without having to write much code. So that's quite nice. But if that doesn't give you exactly what you want, there is another sort of an underlying processor API, which is what it's actually using. So you can go and write things directly from there if you want to. It's different from other processing um, engines because, or processing technologies because it doesn't have a separate processing engine. As you saw, I'm just running my app and Kafka. That is literally it. And it does all of that nice stuff. And it's using the Kafka topics for resiliency and scalability. So it means that you can be sure that if your Kafka Streams app dies, it comes back, it'll just carry on where it left off because it's making use of all those nice things in Kafka. And unlike with Kafka Connect, you don't have to run anything separate. You just run your one app. So tomorrow I'm doing a talk on Kafka and Kubernetes, but I just wanted to do a slide on it because some of you might not want to go to that talk or um, might just want a little preview. So um, in the past, people have said to me like, oh, should you run Kafka and Kubernetes? I think definitely yes. More and more people are doing it. There is no reason not to run Kafka on Kubernetes, especially if you're already running all of your apps on Kubernetes it makes sense to just run it all in one place. But there are some things to consider. So throughout the talk today, we have talked about all the different ways that Kafka is resilient and available and all of that goodness. But if you suddenly run it on Kubernetes in not quite the right way, you can quickly undo all of the work that the Kafka community has done. So tomorrow I'm going to be talking about um, exactly which parts of the Kubernetes um, underlying system you need to be aware of and which parts of Kafka you need to be aware of and how they then match together so you can build a system that makes use of all the good availability stuff in both Kafka and Kubernetes. Uh, some of the things that I'll be touching on include liveness and readiness, managing state, because um, even though Kafka is highly available, it might be that you do still want to persist things, uh, persist the data on your brokers somewhere that isn't just in the app, because if it's on a container and it dies, it's not there anymore. Uh, talking about node affinity, external access. So we didn't go too much today into the difference between listeners and advertised listeners. When you're running locally, you don't really need to think about it, but particularly in containers, it's um, definitely a topic that you need to be aware of. And then also automation. So there are plenty of um, projects out there that are already helping you run Kafka on Kubernetes. Um, so our product Event Streams runs on Kubernetes. Um, we're using Helm for our automation. Um, other projects like the Strimzy open source project are using operators. So you definitely can run Kafka on Kubernetes. If you want to mo know more details, then do come to my talk tomorrow. So We've covered all sorts of things in the talk today. We've looked at the Kafka cluster itself, the fact that it has these brokers, how they work, the idea of replication, and also that they give you scalability through all of the different partitions. We've also talked about Zookeeper and how that is used as part of Kafka, but also the fact that it's going away at some point, so keep an eye out for that. We've then looked at the producers and the consumers, and particularly all of the different configuration options. And you really can, both with the broker level and the producers and consumers, configure Kafka to do exactly what you want it to do. So you do need to be aware of that when you're starting to use it. And then we've looked at Kafka Connect and Kafka Streams. So if you're going to be flowing data from an external system that isn't Kafka into Kafka, then a lot of times it makes sense to use Connect. And if you're wanting to process the data and do some streams processing on that data, you can use Kafka Streams. And actually, a lot of places where I've spoken to people and they've said, actually, we're not going to use Kafka Connect because we want to do some special processing or something, actually what they could have done is used Kafka Connect and Streams in collaboration with each other. So. Kafka Connect, you can provide sort of transformations on the data as it's flowing in, but 
Kafka Streams is so powerful that it really makes sense to flow the data straight from that external system into Kafka. You don't have to write any additional code, you just run some scripts. You can make use of all the good stuff that other people in the community are building around connectors, like um, connectors for all the different JDBC databases, or um, MemQ, for example, or Elasticsearch, all of those good ones. And then once it's in your Kafka, you can use the stream processing. So if you're going to take away five things from this talk, this is what I want you to take away. Kafka is the de facto event streaming platform. I originally wrote becoming the de facto on here, but I think at this point it is. The fact that there's so many people here sort of speaks to that. And the community is growing so much every year. I've been to the Kafka summits for the last like four of them, I think. And every time I go, there's just more and more people and there's more people adding to this community. So you really are starting to use something that is getting a lot of um, sort of emphasis in the community and lots of people building stuff around it. It has scalability and availability built in. It's very configurable, so you can get it set up exactly how you want it, but that comes with the caveat that you have to make sure you set it up correctly. So do look at other options for people hosting it for you. If you don't want to spend your time tuning Kafka, it depends on your use case. You can use Kafka Connect for connecting to other systems and then Kafka Streams for event stream processing. That was all we had. Um, so I've put up a few links here to the Kafka Quick Start Guide to connect streams and the connectors. And if you do want to know any more about event streams as an option to run Kafka for you on our on-cloud offering or to provide a Kubernetes-based system that is easier for you to deploy and has things like a UI, a schema registry for uh, versioning your data, uh, your events, then you can have a look at event streams. And I will have some event streams cards at the front if you are interested. Uh, so thank you very much. And are there any questions? Yeah. So for event archiving, yes. So for event archiving, if you're just trying to get your data out of Kafka and into a system to run um, like long term, I would say that uh, looking at a Kafka Connect connector is a good way to do that. There are quite a lot of connectors around. A lot of the database ones as well will go both ways. So you can do change data capture to get it in, but then you can flow the data back out again as well. Um, so that is definitely a good place to start. The one caveat with Kafka Connect is depending on the system, you sometimes find that you, the way Kafka Connect is built, you just can't write a connector that works for that. So in that case, you could use a standard consumer. But if you can use a connector, I would highly recommend it because it just means less work for you. Yep. Um, on your discussion about, uh, I, I can see how you can use uh, Kafka to connect between different systems being services. What about the browser? Is it possible that you can publish things to, to, from, a, from a browser to Kafka, but also read from Kafka to the browser? Out of the box, I right? So... There are there are there is a connector, for example, for things like MQTT or other devices that run outside of Kafka. Your your options basically are writing a um, consumer producer. So you can use Node, for example, if your front end is written in Node. Um, I can't remember off the top. Are we using which is the Node library that we use? Node RD Kafka, which is built on top of LibRD Kafka. So you can make use of that. Um, depending on what is creating the events on the browser side, it might be that you can, that there's a system that uses it. Um, so LinkedIn, when they originally created Kafka, they did it for collecting data from their front end systems, and they were basically just using a standard con uh, producer. But it might. Listening to an event, like, uh, is it possible? to publish events on the browser to see that updates are coming or something like that? So you could have Kafka and have a producer running that's pushing to your front end. I don't know specifically about what technologies are available to do notifications on the browser. Um, I personally haven't looked at that. I'm a more of a back-end developer. <laughs> um, but there are so many. So what I would say is it's definitely worth having a little look at all of the different talks that happened at uh, Kafka Connect uh, at 
what am I trying to say? The Kafka Summit, because there were loads of talks there, and I think there were, were some more front end ones, but I personally didn't go to them because I don't do front end that much. <laughs> Any more questions? This is where we're testing my eyesight. <laughs> okay. Well, you can always come ask questions at the end. Um, so Andrew is having to head home today, but I'll be here as well tomorrow, and I'll generally be around the IBM booth if you do have questions. Um, so after that, thank you very much. Thank you.